Hi. Welcome to sensing number 12. And we are doing sparkling. So we must be having a special occasion. I think I'm um, hearing there's a resurgence of interest in sparkling wines in the country. That's fantastic. But we're going to detour a little bit from our normal way of doing the sensings. A couple things. One, instead of just doing one grape from different regions, we're going to be doing one style called sparkling from uh, three different countries. Germany, Spain, France. You may also want to throw in a bottle of Italian like Prosecco or Asistamani, something like that. Uh, but um, for a class I was taking, I had to do these three. So I said, oh, these are good three to try. I don't think I'd had a German sec before. So that was interesting. Anyway, you may want to stop at this recording and go buy a selection that is, is, is of interest to you. The one thing you're going to find, these different sparklings all are made from different grapes, uh, but the style by which they are made has a lot to do with how elegant they are and the price. And we'll be talking about that and explaining that. Again, we're going three different countries. We're sticking with the UC Davis for going, looking at the wine in the glass and nose, taste, feel. But the one thing we're deterring from on this one is we're not going to be showing you the lengthy tasting that takes place of each of these. We think you've got the methodology down pat. So we're going to be going through introductory material and then we'll show you the results of our tasting. Um, starting off, a little background on sect. Germany has a continental climate and what that really means is it has very cold winters and very hot summers, very short growing season. Uh, so there are only so many grapes that will survive that kind of a climate and so many styles of wine. Uh, they tend to be uh, more acidic. Uh, they don't have a long enough summer to really ripen. The soil is slate and clay. The sect that we're trying today comes from the South Germany, but it can come from anywhere in Germany. Their sparkling rules in Germany are very lax. Uh, their vinification method, and there are three basic vinification methods for sparklings, is tank. It is a somewhat less expensive method than about anything else. Both fermentations take place in the tank, they're pressurized and then bottled. There's no aging on the lees. And that means, hey, if there had been yeast placed in the bottle and they were aged on it for a while, you'd get that really nice doughy, yeasty thing you get out of French champagnes. Uh, the, the quality or the names of the wine, this one in particular, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Uh, for those wines are sourced from a specific region, it would be noted on the label. So it's a higher level classification of sect. Vinter sect is sparkling wine of a single vintage and grape variety in the traditional method. Uh, traditional method, we'll explain at the end, is the greatest way to do it, but most time consuming and most expensive. Pro wine they have is a sparkling wine, lowest class. The profile of a sect seems to be smoky lime aroma, dry citrus, with white pepper on the palate. You see Moselle is uh, way up in uh, the left hand corner here. Uh, country is bounded by the CH is, is Switzerland, France, Luxembourg, and Belgium on the uh, west coast. Um, but the cold climate, not a whole lot of options with grapes not a lot of regulations on how they make their sparkling. Cava, we're getting into a warmer climate. The Penendez region has a Mediterranean climate. Uh, that means it's got a longer growing season. It's got a body of water that moderates extremes in any climate. Uh, the soil is limestone and clay. Method traditional is a vinification method. That is the top of the tree. 
That is the best way to make a sparkling wine. That is the way champagne from France is made. It's very involved and uh, timely, uh, time consuming, more expensive. But cava has a, a technique which cuts that time down quite a bit in Spain. The grapes are unique to their sparkling. Zarlolo, Macabeo, Parada, Vieira, these are grapes you probably haven't heard of before, but are unique to Spain and to their sparkling wines, Cava. Uh, they have different degrees of sweetness like Champagne has, Brut Natural all the way up to Dolce. Um, these go from the driest to more sweet. Uh, they're starting to do, well, they'll get more increased time aging on the leaves if it's one of these higher classifications. Cava de Garda, Cava Superior Reserva, Superior Gran Reserva, Superior de Parage, Calafacido. Uh, those actually are aging on the leaves and they're gonna be more complex and they're gonna be more yeast because of it. The palate profile is lemon, apple, melon, peach, almond paste. Um, the prices really vary on a cava, we found out. The one we tried that cost uh, closer to $22, there's a version of it that's about nine, and I liked it better. So uh, you may want to do a little shopping and trying of some of these different cavas. They're really nice. Uh, I'll explain in a minute how they have a little bit of a shortcut in the method traditionnel versus how the French make it. I'm going to go back and uh, let you see where um, this cava comes from. It is, it's going to be hard to see because the picture on my uh, computer is overlaying it. But up near Barcelona, CBRC there, is Panen Panendes, right on the Mediterranean. That's clearly how it gets a much warmer climate. But it's nothing like in the middle of Spain where it is hot as heck and they've got a real irrigation issue that's challenged them for many years in winemaking. Now, <laughs> a piece de resistance, Champagne. Um, one of my favorite regions it is really kind of fun if you're in Paris and you see all these cars, I'll say a lot of them Mercedes, heading out on A2, I think is the highway, outside Paris, heading east, so northeast east, to the Champagne region for dinner on a Saturday night. There's so many great restaurants in this area. Uh, the climate is continental, so they are challenged like Germany is in making these wines. These grapes, that they used to make champagne were really good for making still wines because they have a short growing season. So over time, uh, they would accidentally create a fizz that was uh, desired for it in the royal courts of France. And so that's how I think there was more interest in trying to understand how to systematically and consistently make a really good sparkling wine. Uh, viticulture, one of their biggest challenges is preventing the vines from freezing. The soil is chalk. There's a lot of interesting stories about that. But there are these chalk um, caves in the Champagne region where much of Champagne is stored today that the Romans built a long, long time ago. And a, a lot of good books written about that and the Nazis finding out about them and what they were able to do with them during World War II. But the three grapes that are used to make champagne in your France, and of course you cannot call it champagne unless it's made in the champagne region in France. If you make it across the street, it can be a Cremant de Bourgogne, which means a, a burgundy sparkling. But if it's on this side of the street, the champagne, it's a champagne. It's made from Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Chardonnay gives it the weight, elegance, and finesse. Pinot Noir structure with some tannin, acidity, and body. And Petit Meunier, some fruit forwardness. Petit, petit, excuse me, Pinot Meunier is kind of the stepchild of the three. 
and I don't believe it's allowed in a Grand Cru Champagne or Premier Cru. Um, there are degrees of dryness. You go to the store, you see something says extra brute. brute. Again, we're going from dry all the way to sweet. D-O-U-X is sweet. Uh, you can get a Blanc de Blanc. A Blanc de Blanc is only made from Chardonnay. Blanc de Noir is made from Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. Rosé is uh, made from Pinot Noir primarily. And the grapes are, the grape skins are not kept in the wine and they live fermentation as long and that's how you get the pink color. Um, we've got non-vintage, vintage and cuvée de prestige. More than 90% of the champagne sold is brute non-vintage. So when you think, oh, I want a such and such year champagne, Ah, that's not such a big deal. The majority of champagne consumed and the French citizens love champagne. Uh, I'm told they drink it like we drink beer. I found this palate profile somewhere and I thought it was humorous, but kind of cool. What's the profile of champagne? Crystalline pearls on the palate, exploding with acidulous flavors of ripe fruit, exotic wood, white flowers. My definition is yeasty, nutty, or so smooth. One of those characteristics. Bubbles rise to a crescendo and then diminish by degrees to close on a note of peace, harmony, and farewell. Okay, fine. But um, my impression has always been when you get into better champagnes, they either take a route that's very nutty and it's very nice or very smooth and you kind of decide which way you want to go. Uh, my preference is, is Verve Clicquot, named after the widow Clicquot. Uh, that's the one in the orange bottle. I think it's fantastic. Uh, the key regions where the grapes come from in the Champagne region to make champagne uh, up in Montagne de Rennes, way up in the north there. Uh, that is where uh, the um, primarily Pinot Noir comes from. It's the northernmost Pinot Noir can stand up to the colder climate. Ballet de la Marne, a little bit more to the west, is home of the two red grapes, the uh, Pinot Noir and the Pinot Meunier. And the Cote de Blanc, down south of Epernay is 100% uh, Chardonnay. The two cities, Rams and Epernay, are the key cities for Champagne. Great restaurants there. And if you want to go uh, see uh, where Dom Perignon worked, you'd head over to uh, Epernay. Um, most interesting. We're going to talk just a little bit about the champagne making process, but it is really cool to go to one of these wineries. I had the opportunity to go to Tétonger uh, and, and others, but Tétonger in the outside Rams, it's in the bottom of an abbey. And I watched the whole process going on. It's been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, there is, they take the three grapes and they press them separately. They ferment them separately. Then the assemblage takes place and the assemblage, hey, I'm blending these wines. And that's a key recipe for a great champagne maker is what is the proportion of these three different grapes that they're going to make. That's a high, highly kept secret. The second formation is in a bottle. And that's a method champenoise is in the same bottle. When I go from as soon as I blend it and I put it in a bottle, that's the bottle you're going to buy in the store. It doesn't leave that bottle. This is what makes this it's part of what makes this process so time consuming and so expensive. Because what they're going to do is they're going to mature the wine in a wooden rack, a whole bunch of bottles in a wooden rack. And there's an individual called a Riddler. And he comes and turns in about a quarter every so often. And this goes on for several months. 
turning slowly, turning slowly. And as he's turning, the bottle's going to start tilting, tilting, tilting more on its nose. So the head of the bottle is going to start to capture the dead yeast cells from the second fermentation in the bottle. And those dead yeast cells are intentionally being slowly, slowly moved to the, the neck of the bottle. Then at the end of that process, they're going to freeze that neck and it's going to come, when they take off this bottle cap, it's going to come flying out. They're going to put another small amount of sugar and yeast and put that cork in, put the wire on, put the foil on, boom. And then while that sugar takes place, it's one going to determine how sweet the, the final champagne is. Two, it's going to create those bubbles inside the bottle. CO2 from the fermentation process that's captured. One of the most difficult things that hindered them was they could never get a bottle that could stand up to the pressure. Uh, so there was an inventor in England who finally came up with a bottle that could handle the pressure of the champagne without exploding. This is kind of a picture uh, portrait of the process. Uh, we talk about the cuvee, the first fermentation takes place, the tirage, they're bottled and blended with a small mixture of yeast to initiate a second fermentation in the bottle. And that mixture is called a liquor de tirage. So then they're aged and we have these dead yeast particles that are going to move down. This is where kava is made somewhat differently. They have a zero palette automated palette that looks like that but it's got four sides to it and it automatically slowly turns the wine. It is not done by a human being slowly. Um, and the other thing that you lose there is the amount of time that the wine ages on the leaves that really gives the French Champagne that yeasty doughy wonderful characteristic. So then we see the riddling, the bottles are rotated, the leaves descend, they're frozen bath. Uh, and then we have the final dosage that uh, defines what the final sweetness it's going to be. And that shows you, I think, uh, grams per liter of residual sugar is the chart below that you'll see. Anyway, we're going to go off now and taste these three, and then we'll come back and bring the results. But enjoy yourself. This is a, a fun thing. If you ever get a chance to go through a sparkling production process, it, it's fascinating. It's really a lot of fun. We'll be back in a little bit. Hi, everybody. It's Marilyn Gracie. We're wrapping up that sparkling sensing we did. It's now the end of March 2021. I don't know how many months ago we started this. We've got a really nice upcoming high-end Burgundy that we're planning in the next month. So if you're interested, keep your eyes open for that. Also, if you want any of the forms we're using, I've got a new form today, um, just email me. I think at the end of each of these, you can see my email. It's uh, winesensing at yahoo.com. And we'll send it to you in its uh, either Adobe, PDF, um, Excel, whatever suits you. Okay. But we've got a little different form I'm going to be presenting for the end of the sparkling. Um, I was taking for a, a second time the International Sommelier Guild's uh, advanced course. And um, in so doing, they've got a different form than the UC Davis one we've been using. Well, this gives some people a variety for every, how you like to rate wines. This one is much less quantitative, much more qualitative, and very interested in the terms used, trying to be more standardized. So I thought I'd toss that in here for the sparkling one. And we only rated them of two of the three that we were talking about. We didn't rate the um, uh, French one. We've got the German and the Spanish. Okay, let's share a screen here. Doesn't want to come up. There we go, thank you very much. If you have any feedback on any of these sensings that you'd like to provide uh, in an email, we'd appreciate that. Okay, here is this new form. Uh, I'm trying to figure out a way I can make it any bigger. 
the smite give me the capability but um at any rate uh what we've got here is um just some basic information about the wine and here it says it's a a riesling sect dry uh, the name of the brand the country germany the region mosel percent of alcohol 12 percent and the price 16.99 then just the you know the same three things we've always been talking about the appearance the nose and in the mouth and um this one is uh let me clear that out of there oh never mind uh light straw at the core clear at the rim with light intensity and light body in the glass with small bubbles they said yeah you can talk definitely talk about the bubbles because here's a line where the bubbles are a key characteristic so whenever you're sensing them either as you see them, uh, as you feel them on your tongue, go ahead and talk about what that's pleasant, why that's pleasant. Does that make it a better experience, a better wine for you? Uh, and this German one was dry with a light body. We're really trying to get better with identifying acidity at the different levels. Uh, low alcohol, light flavor intensity of what? Bitter lemon and lime, grapefruit with a short finish and very light body uh, with respect. And then at the end, it more, this is more of a qualitative score sheet. Um, with respect to other sparklings, what do you think about it? What do you think about it with respect to the price? Uh, does this need to mature more? Um, and what would you fit, pair this with? What kind of food do you think? So we're saying, hey, pad Thai or Peking duck, something like that. Um, these kava and this was a uh, vivudas uh, heredad kava brut reserve uh, uh, from panendes 12 percent alcohol at 22.99 i highly recommend you give a shot too at the one that's on the market between like seven and nine dollars i think it is delightful and kava's using the method champenoise the real champagne method can be very, very good and um, not expensive. So it's clean with pungent aroma. This had more of a, a strong aroma to it. Uh, lemon, apple cider, and yeast of light intensity. Uh, dry with light body, high acidity, low alcohol, medium intensity. And it had lemon, yellow flower. We're getting eloquent here, you realize. With short to moderate finish. Uh, this one we decided is balanced and more bold than the sect with consistent lemon on the nose and palate, but not very delicate or charming or complex. It seemed overpriced with respect to kava pricing that we've seen. It's ready to drink and may pair well with quesadilla, sharp cheese, veggies, and guacamole. So at any rate, here's a second chart. If you, again, want the format for either of these blank ones that you can use, just email us. You'll see the email at the end of this. Uh, hope you've enjoyed the sparkling. I definitely recommend that you give a shot at some of these cavas, and I'm still kind of a nut at the higher end French champagnes. I think you need to get up to Vieux Telegraph or Tétanger or one of those, my personal opinion, and everybody's got one. So at any rate, um, let me stop sharing this. Hope you've enjoyed these tastings. Uh, we're not done. Be well. And we're all starting to get our shots now and life will go back to whatever normal is now. Oh, and um, this is Oliver. He hung around. Heidi Morris and Spot have taken off. But you'll likely see them before too long anyway. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.